So if you're first-time guests, and let's open up in a word of prayers. We'll begin our uh, Wednesday night evening service. I'll ask uh, Brother Michael Wise if you could open us in a word of prayer tonight. a prayer request you would like to have uh, prayed for. If you want to just raise your hand, we got some uh, folks that could come around and pass out a green prayer card for you. And so just raise your hand and we'll get by and get that to you. I'd like you to pray for um, a couple different dear folks in our church. Gene Rhodes, uh, one of the men of our church, uh, Gene and Creta Rhodes, they've been, been away for a little bit due to health. And uh, Gene Rhodes has been on dialysis, and so he's, he's decided to, to uh, stop dialysis just due to health complications and just the enduring effect of that. And so, uh, Gene, they've given him just a few days left to live. So you could pray for Gene and Creta Rhodes' family. Gene and Creta Rhodes, definitely want to pray for those guys. Uh, love those guys. And so also pray for the Maple family, uh, Chris and Aaron Maple. Uh, Chris had passed away last week. Uh, he's in his 30s, and they have four kids and so uh, from illness, and so I want to uh, pray for Chris and Aaron Maple for their, their family as well. And so um, if you have a prayer request, just raise your hand, and I'll get that green prayer card to you, and then we'll gather those up at the end of the service. And so a couple things in the bulletin just want to highlight uh, before we jump into the sermon tonight. Uh, we have our men's prayer uh, breakfast coming up this Saturday. Encourage all the men to be a part of that at 8 o'clock. Uh, looking forward to a devotion from Brian Techmeyer is going to be bringing that, and uh, he's got a lot of, a lot of good, good wisdom to share, and, so, and then we'll have a time of prayer and breakfast. So if you can be here at 8 o'clock on Saturday, men, I uh, encourage you to be here for that. Uh, they had a great time, women, uh, the ladies did, the ladies' gospel and game night this last Sunday night, had like 60 ladies out, and appreciate them doing that. A couple other lady prayer meeting and ladies' discipleship group inside the bulletin there. Uh, Leslie Mattioli will be leading some of those opportunities, and you can sign up for those in the foyer. Uh, the one for the ladies' discipleship group, you can sign up for the ladies' prayer meeting is going to be at the YMCA from 11 to noon, so uh, you can check that out. Also, coming up this summer, we're going to be doing some more sports-focused ministry for the kids on Wednesday nights. And uh, we're going to be having a VBS earlier in the summer and then having some sports-focused things throughout the summer. So if that's something you're interested in, working with the kids, working in that arena of uh, uh, ministering to kids on Wednesday nights in, in, a, in a probably do some weeks of volleyball, basketball, flag football, soccer, some different things like that, there's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. So you can uh, sign up for that if you'd be interested in helping out. So... Uh, and then finally, we have our Fall Family Day coming up here, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, and we're going to have a great, great day lined up. So there's sign-ups in the Welcome Center for both food as well as uh, different activities, if you could please sign, sign up for those events. And then there's also uh, some flyers you can pick up as well. So uh, without further, uh, if you have your Bibles, look with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 6. Uh, I want to read a few verses there to kind of start off tonight, Matthew chapter number 6. When you find your place, you can stand with me to honor the Word of God. I, uh, I know some, some avid Steelers fans came up to me Sunday with their jerseys on. I'm not going to say anything about how the Bengals beat the Steelers. I won't talk about that from the church pulpit, all right? Not going not gonna, to not gonna go over those things. We want to stay humble, don't we, Carl? We want to stay humble. So uh, we won't rub that in their face. We won't do that. Uh, no. And, it, and aren't you so glad there's more important things in sports than life? Amen. So thankful. I, 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 sometimes when, I, when I, I used to get so involved into that stuff um, that, you know, I just, I'm, it's nice when you look at life and you say, you know, there, is a, there, is, there are some things that are much more important. It's okay to get excited about different things going on in the world, but it's... Uh, it's definitely right to keep the main thing the main thing. So Matthew 6, let's read through verse 1 down to verse number 8. The Bible says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be 
they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let thy, not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be, be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thy, thou hast shut the door, uh, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when, thou, when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Father, we do thank you for your word tonight. We ask that it would accomplish all your desire in our hearts and lives. Conform us to the image of Christ. May we glorify you with our thoughts, our, our attentiveness tonight. I know some folks have had long weeks and long days, and I pray that our focus would be upon your word for these next few minutes. And I pray that Jesus Christ would be mightily exalted in the teaching and preaching of your word. Conform us, Lord, to your image. Help us to know you more, to be people of prayer, uh, to be early and often in prayer. And I pray for the teens and the kids' services tonight as well as the other classes going on. If anyone doesn't know Christ, that they might be saved. We ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Man, you may be seated this evening. If I were to ask you, are there things in life that can hinder our prayers? Not, not cause us to not pray as much as we should, but are there things that can actually hinder our prayer to God? What do you think? So maybe thinking about that. Does the Bible say there are things that can keep our prayers from being answered? Does the Bible specifically say there are things that can keep our prayers from being answered? Well, I, uh, I hope there are because I have 10 things that I've listed here. <laughs> no, but I uh, preached and taught um, throughout the years on how we are supposed to pray, what the Bible says about how we are supposed to pray, and, and you really find a, a good layout of that in verse 9 down to verse number uh, 15. Uh, Jesus goes through what people have called the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is a model prayer Jesus gives us. But we read the verses leading up to verse number 9, and what you find is before Jesus taught people how to pray, he taught them how to not pray. Before he said, this is how you should come to God in prayer, he says, this is, these are ways that you should not come to God in prayer. And so I think it is essential for us to learn uh, things that can hinder our prayer life, things that can cause our prayers to not be hindered. We looked at four of those last Wednesday. We're going to look at the next six tonight. So 10 ways to hinder your prayers. Uh, these are things to avoid. Uh, let me review the first four very quickly. Number one, we talked last Wednesday about pretending in prayer. Uh, we learned that Jesus, in verse number 5 and 6, says if you want to have your prayers hindered, pray like the hypocrites. The word hypocrite means a pretender, somebody who played a part. That's where the word comes from, hypocrites in the Greek. And so uh, if you want to have your prayers hindered, uh, pray so that others can see you. Pray so that they will think you're really spiritual. Uh, pray for the purpose of drawing attention to self instead of uh, focusing on giving that prayer in honor of God and seeking His ear. Secondly, we looked at pride in prayer. An example of this prideful hypocrite we saw in Luke chapter 18, being seen in prayer. Jesus says, don't, don't pray to be seen in prayer. Not, that, that's not the goal. It's not wrong to be seen in prayer. The problem is desiring to be seen, desiring to be admired. And that's what the Lord rebukes, both in Matthew 6 as well as Luke 18. Thirdly, we saw emptiness in prayer. In, in verse 7 and 8, Jesus says, don't pray with vain repetition. The Jews prayed 18 prayers in the morning and at noon and in the evening, and it was called the, uh, um, the, the Shamana Ezra, which is a Hebrew word which means the 18. Uh, we learned that repeating prayers are not wrong if done in sincerity. The problem is not repeating prayer. The problem is praying uh, with vain repetition. Again, repetition is not wrong, but vain repetition is wrong. So Jesus prayed the same prayers over and over. We saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane. So just remember that it's okay to, uh, I remember early in my Christian life, I thought, well, I've already asked God, so I really don't need to ask him again. I don't really need to burden him with this, you know, just give it to him one time and that should cover it. 
Uh, But then I came to the Bible and learned that uh, men prayed over and over and over again. Paul prayed three times, Lord, take this thorn away from my side. And then the Lord answered. Jesus prayed the same prayer three times in the Garden of Gethsemane, we learned. Uh, Number four, we learned that earning answers to prayer is a way to hinder our prayers. Verse 7, Jesus says in Matthew 6, he says, For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. The Jews thought the, the more you prayed uh, that, that God will answer you, the more you pray that whoever prolongs his prayer, his prayer does not return empty. Uh, th- this is how the pagans prayed. If you, if you study into Buddhism, even in Catholicism, they count beads and uh, they go through this system of just uh, saying it over and over and over and over and over again. The same prayer, if you've ever seen some of these uh, situations where it's the same thing repeated, uh, really in a non-focused attention to what you're praying, but just just saying the words. And the idea is, is feeling like you're earning favor with God by putting your time in. I'm punching a clock, saying the prayer, I'm earning this. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said, Christians' prayers are measured by weight and not by length. Many of the most prevailing prayers have been as short as they were strong. So those are four that we looked at last time. Let's jump into the next six tonight. Number five, you can hold your place there in Matthew 6. We'll be jumping over to James 4. But the fifth one is not praying. Something that can hinder your prayer is just simply by not praying. Uh, James chapter 4 verse number 1 says this, Uh, If you want to know where James is, it's right after the book of Hebrews. Uh, James, just go to the right, end up in Revelation, you've gone too far. James chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it says this, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? He said, Ye lust and ye have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war. He says, Yet ye have not because you what? You ask not. Now, in this section, James is discussing three different wars that are going on. The first war is fighting among the people, one with another. That's why in James 4, 1, he says, from whence come wars and fightings, he says, among you. So the the, the believers that James is writing to, James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he says, where do these wars come from? They come from among you. Verse 11 of James chapter 4, he says, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Speak not evil one of another. We know James chapter 3 is about the danger of the what? The tongue, right? Yeah, the tongue, the the problem with the mouth. Uh, So he says in chapter 4, and and he deals with that at length in James chapter 3 because it was a problem in the church slanderous conversation among each other. They were speaking evil one of another. If you, if you flip back a couple verses from James chapter 4, you James chapter 3, verse 14, notice what he says there in your Bible. James 3, 14, he says, But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. Don't deceive yourself, he's saying. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but, the earth, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. And he's talking about true and false wisdom there. And and, and some people thought they had true wisdom. He says, if your wisdom causes you to have bitter envying, causes you to be sensual, or causes you to have this bitter envying and strife in your heart toward each other, he said, that is a devilish kind of wisdom. You ever known somebody who was perhaps an intellect, uh, somebody who maybe thought they knew it all, but they were just contentious? He's saying that is not a godly wisdom. That is a satanic kind of wisdom. So, So understand that. Um, why, is it, why is it such a sad thing when Christians fight among themselves, according to Jesus in John 13, 34, and 35? Look at these verses. Why is it such a sad thing to see that? Well, in John 13, 34, and 5, Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So the first reason it's sad is because if Christians are fighting among themselves, then they are disobeying the command of God to love. And then verse 35, he says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one toward another. And so uh, Christians can become a bad testimony to the world when they're bitter, envying, and strife. You know, when churches go through splits and divisions and, and all that stuff, what's that say to a lost world? It's, it's, a bad, it's a bad testimony, isn't it? I remember when we came here to start Lighthouse Baptist Church, going on around 12 years ago, and... Um, I, I, I had multiple people say this to me. What church did you guys split off of? They were totally serious. I was like, no, 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 we're not a church split. I said, we, uh, we were sent out from a church 
um, in a positive way. Like they were happy to, to have us go start a church. We wanted to come start a church. We felt the Lord leading us. And they're like, oh, okay. Like it was shocking. They're like, the only way I've ever known churches getting started was like a church split. That's bad, That's bad, isn't it? That's bad. They've been in a church split and they were going to start another church split. And it's, that's, you know, church splitting is not God's plan to reach the world. Uh, th- that's, not, that's not the successful way of church planning. And most of the time when you see church splits, they usually don't work well because that's not the biblical pattern. Uh, something is not right there. Uh, so, so fighting among the believers there was one issue that he's dealing with in James 4. And then there was fighting within themselves. James 4, verse 1, notice what he says there. From whence come wars and fightings among you, so it's among each other. He says, come they not even of your lust that war where at? What's that word? In your members? Yep, yeah, in your members. So it's, there's something inside of us that produces this antagonism with one another. James 4, 2, he says, ye lust. He goes on and says, ye kill and desire. He says, ye fight in war. There is something in us that's, that's raging. And then thirdly, we have fighting with God. Look at James 4, verse 4. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So you see fighting among Christians, fighting among themselves, and then fighting with God. Now what question does James ask in verse number one again? He says, from whence come wars and conflicts among you? And where does he say this divisive spirit comes from? He says it comes from yourself, from the lust that war in your members And so listen, when people get into a fight, argument, or some kind of strife, who do they usually blame? The other person or the devil. You know, the devil made me do it. You know, Uh, somebody else, they they point the finger away from themselves. We love to shift the blame because it, in our mind, it justifies any wrongs that we have done in handling the situation. People can so easily justify why they've behaved some way that was unchristlike. Maybe they flew off the handle and had some sinful response. James makes clear that the source that produces a divisive Christian, the source that creates a spirit of disunity in a person who causes them to fight with others is inside the person themselves. It is from their lust. It is from their cravings, desires that are raging inside the person. So often people think the source of conflict is some external force. God's word here is telling us it's not external, it is internal. They want things to go their way. They want control of others. They want others to line up with their desires. Uh, There is then a divisive spirit in people that are unspiritual. The carnal Christian is a Christian who is at odds with himself They're at odds with others, and they become ultimately at odds with God. They are a miserable person. You ever known somebody who's just kind of a miserable person? You thought it was you. You ever had that person that just, like, takes the conflict to another level that you were were not expecting? You're like, why did they get so, and it just, like, you're, you're almost, your mouth was hanging open, and like, it, like, man, they really just did not see that coming. You ever get land blasted? I've been land blasted before. Uh, praise God, not, not too often recently, so don't, don't pray for that. So, um, but, but what I found through the years when it's that person that just seems to be in, you know, they're miserable all the time. They don't just conflict with you, they conflict with like everybody else. They have problems at work, they have problems at home, they have problems at church. They have problems at Walmart. They have problems at the red light. They have, I mean, they, 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 there's conflicts going on everywhere. And you know what I've learned through the years? I've begun to have some empathy for those people and just think, you know what? They're, they make other people suffer, but they're actually suffering more than anyone. They're a miserable person. Either they're totally lost, which is very possible, or they are just completely carnal. You know what happens? People that live on the throne of their own heart become a miserable person. Because you try to control. And contr- because control is an illusion that you have no power to, to, to make and to change people. You have no power to change people. You have no power to, we have barely enough power to change ourselves. 
uh, to do what we want to do. That's, we, we totally depend on the Lord even for that. And so it causes people to, 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 to always have anxiety and anger when they try to control things. It, it produces those things. And, and James is telling them here that these, these issues, the, the person, people that are being at odds with other people, they're at odds with God as well. They're at odds with himself. James first then lists the wrong actions they are committing in verse number two. He says, you lust, you kill, you desire, you covet, you fight, you war. Verse number two, he lists all these wrong activities. Notice that. Now, after James lists the wrong actions that they are committing, he then lists the action that's right that they are not committing. He says, you're doing all of these things that are wrong, but you're not doing the thing that is right. And the one thing that this person is not doing right is what? They're not praying. He says, you have not because you ask not. You ever notice the person trying to live in control of everything and they're making their life miserable and everybody else miserable? They're not a prayerful person. You know why? Because they can handle it. They're going to force the situation. They're going to be conflicting. A lack of prayer in our lives will evidence a lack of dependence upon God. If we do not spend time in prayer, it is because we either do not feel we need God or that we can handle the situation ourselves. Prayer is an act on our part of dependency. Therefore, it is natural, it is natural that the prayerless life will reflect a divisive spirit. Because if God's not on the throne, man is therefore by default on the throne. And, and that will always result in a carnal life. Just read Galatians 5. The flesh and the spirit war, right? What happens with the fleshly life? Well, there's emulation, strife, division, heresies. There's all these problems. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, or self-control. Anybody want to be married to the person that's filled with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith? I mean, isn't it so easy to get along with them? It's so, so the spiritual life leads to a body of harmony. Do you notice when you spend time in prayer with God, how much smoother the day goes? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like when you spend time in prayer, it's like, you know why that is? Because prayer dethrones us. It dethrones us. It keeps us from seeking our own. In prayer we say, your kingdom come, your will be done. Prayer has never been for the purpose of getting God on board with our will. It's always about us conforming our will to God's. If you think prayer is you getting God on board with you, you're going to be a miserable person. So that, that is not a result of a change in external pressures, the peace that we have. Rather, it is the change of the inner person when you have that peace. Now, one great hindrance to prayer, like I said here, is by just simply not praying. If, if you were to hold your place there in James 4, and if you have your place there in Matthew 6, notice what Jesus says here in Matthew 6, verse 5. He says, and when thou prayest, verse 6 says, but thou, when thou prayest, Verse 7 says, but when you pray, when you read those things, what is it presupposing from the Lord? That you pray. He expects that to be something you do. So prayer is to be central in the Christian life. I think it could be very shocking uh, if we uh, look at our life and realize there are seasons of our life where we don't spend intentional prayer with God. I mean, every Wednesday uh, at the very end of service, we have an opportunity to pray. What, what would be a reason that we should say, hey, I, I don't know that I can pray with somebody else or I should hang around and pray with somebody else? What, what, what good reason would be there that, that I should say, hey, I'd rather not do that? Uh, realize prayer is ministering to others. Every Wednesday I get to pray with somebody else. Do you realize there's people in here tonight that are going through some seriously broken stuff? You ever consider maybe God has you here tonight because he says, hey, I want you to go pray for that person. I want you to minister to them. You've got to first hear their need. Wouldn't it be nice going up to somebody who may be uh, going through some severe health issues and struggling with something and say, hey, uh, can I pray for you tonight about that and, and be able to pray for each other? So just realize when you pray with other people, that's a great way to lift them up. It lifts me up. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus said this, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened. Everyone that asks receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opened. So Jesus taught that there is, a, there is a God in heaven that responds to the seeker. If you pray and seek the Lord with 
the pure heart and, 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 and a right motive of honoring God, then, then God hears. I, I love what Charles Spurgeon says here. Listen to what he says. He says, if we possess little of God in his kingdom, almost certainly we have asked little. Remember this text, and I, it's out of Psalms chapter number 2. Jehovah says to his own son, ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. In Psalms 2, God the Father asks the son, he says, he tells the son, he says, ask of me and I'll basically give you the world as your inheritance. Just ask me, son. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, picture of the glory and sovereignty of God. Spurgeon goes on to say, if the, if the royal and divine Son of God cannot be exempted from the rule of asking that he may have, you and I cannot expect the rule to be relaxed in our favor. Why should it be? If you may have everything by asking and nothing without asking, I beg you to see how absolutely vital prayer is, and I beseech you to abound in it. Do you know, brothers, what great things are to be had for the asking? Have you ever thought of it? Does it not stimulate you to pray fervently? All the heaven lies before your grasp of the asking man. All the promises of God are rich and inexhaustible, and their fulfillment is to be had by prayer. Spurgeon talks a lot about when you go to prayer, go to God with some specific thoughts, like what are you wanting God to answer? That's why it's good to write prayers down. God, I want you to please answer this request. God, do this. Lord, may this come to pass. Go to Him with specific prayers and um, they, they should obviously line up with what the Bible talks about, but it needs to be a, a child of God coming to God asking. Like, I, I think that we have, we have lived the life of a pauper so much spiritually because we're not asking like we should. Uh, so number five, by simply not asking. Number six, another way to hinder our prayers is to have wrong motives in prayer. It's, we go back to James chapter number four. Notice what he says in verse number three. There are some people who say, no, I, I don't have a problem. I do ask. I do pray. I'm not afraid to ask. Well, James 4.3 says, ye ask and receive not. Well, well, there's people that don't have any answers to prayer because they don't ask. Verse 2, verse 3 says, you ask and you receive not. Why? He says, because you ask amiss or for the wrong reason. And what is this wrong purpose? He says that ye may consume it upon your lusts. The, the word lust there, some, sometimes it's translated as lust, can also mean covetousness. Uh, so ask here in James chapter 4, verse 3, is in the middle voice, meaning you are asking for yourself. In context, James is describing selfish prayers, self-centered prayer requests. Uh, we must be careful that when we come to God in prayer, that our focus in prayer is, is, is with the right motive. Ask yourself this question. What is the motivation of my prayer? When I'm praying this to God, what is my motivation in asking Him? Why would I pray this to Him? What is my motive? Why do I want this to be answered? If this prayer is answered, what, 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 what would it produce? How would it glorify God? James warns those who are actually praying that their motive was driven by their lust or covetousness. They would be the ones who benefited um, they wanted to, to, to see this answered for themselves. But the motive of the believer cannot be themselves. Rather, our motive must be the glory of God. Notice, notice what Paul says in Romans 14, 7 and 8. He says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So to live in such a way that, that we belong to Him. 1 Corinthians 1 Again, these are, these are verses that can help purify the motive of the praying person. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 says, For ye you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise... This is so funny. He's telling the church of Corinth, Corinth, he says, Look around, guys. Not many wise people are called, are they? Not many mighty, not many noble. I mean, he's just like putting them down. Like, you, you, you know, we're just, we're just the, the base people. The common people. Verse 27, he says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God's chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The base things of the world and the things which are despised as God's chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to not those things that are. He's just talking about how, you know, and, and this is one problem that has happened in churches over the years. They've always tried to get that, that athlete or that star to be the, the Christian representative. Boy, if you know, there was just like, if Tom Brady got saved and really started living for God, just imagine what that would do for the kingdom. Maybe nothing. 
may be something good. I don't know. But God can use a common pauper that gets saved off the street or some drug addict to reach more people than a Tom Brady. Amen. That's the truth. Because God's chosen. The power is not in somebody's athletic ability to be able to be a gospel witness. The power is in the Lord through a weak vessel. That's why Jesus told Paul, when you're weak, then I'm strong. So some churches have become naive over the years thinking, oh, if verse 30, he says, 31, he says that according it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The, the purpose for what we do in our life, he says, is to be for the glory of God. That's why 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And you could insert prayer into that. So if you want to hinder your prayer, make yourself the motive of the prayer instead of God. If you God want God to answer your prayer, then make his glory the answer. I, I've even said to, to people that pray for their spouse to be saved, I ask them, why, why do you want them to be saved? They're like, so they can be saved. I'm like, yeah, but what's your motivation? Why do you want them to be saved? I said, you, you realize you can pray for your spouse to be saved and God not answer because your motive could be corrupted? You can have the right prayer, but the wrong motive. Well, how could you, how could it be wrong? How could you pray wrongly for your spouse to be saved if obviously God wants to save them and, and you want them to be saved? Well, why do you want them to be saved? Well, if your motive for them being saved is so you could have a good marriage, so that you guys get along better, so they could sit in church with you, like what's your motivation? Yourself? You? Like so that your life gets smoother? Or is it so that there could be a sinner that can now bring glory to God? Like what's your motivation? So you have to purify your motive. Your motive should be that I want to see my spouse saved so that, number one, they glorify God, and then I, second, I'm just secondarily a beneficiary of that vertical relationship. You see what I'm saying? That's, you have to make sure your motivation is right. Even praying for, for good things can become corrupted by a wrong motive. Number seven, let me give you the last few. Number seven, a seventh cause for a hindrance to prayer is unconfessed sin in our life. Unconfessed sin. Uh, listen to some of these verses. Um, Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. What's the last part of that verse say, church? That he will not hear. So God will not hear because of iniquity and sin. Psalm 66, 18, let's read this together. If I regard, let's read it good and loud together, ready? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So uh, that's, that's a very clear statement. If, if I have known sin in my heart, God's not going to hear me. Uh, Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Isaiah 1, 15 says, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Here And he goes on and begins to talk to them about the sins of their life. But then he goes on and says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He said, I'll cleanse you, but you haven't come to be cleansed. The remedy for sin in our life is 1 John 1, 9. He says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The prayer that God hears of the, the sinning Christian is the prayer of repentance. We come to God and say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Wash me, cleanse me. This is the Psalm 32, the Psalm 51, prayer of the repentant sinner. They have to come. You know, I think about an erring child. Any parent in here knows that a child can get away from them and go down a wrong road. But if that child come back home brokenhearted with with a heavy heart and repentive spirit, and they called out to you to forgive them for all their wrongdoings, that parent, that loving parent, would embrace them with forgiveness. In the same way, that's what our Father does. Also, in this unconfessed sin category, is unforgiveness toward others can hinder our prayers. Matthew 6, verse 14, Jesus says, If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If God tells us that we cannot be at odds with others and right with Him, is it worth holding on to unforgiveness? 
Is it worth it? When we choose to not forgive others, what is that ultimately saying to God? God, I, I okay being at odds with you. I have a right to bitterness. We care more about ourselves than our relationship with God. We elevate ourselves above God. Think about this. If God is willing to forgive someone who sins, and he's the most offended because he's the most holy, who am I who is the less offended to hold on to that, who is the more sinful? So uh, it is a very, very self-righteous thing to not forgive somebody. And that's, I think forgiveness is the hardest thing for Christians to do. It really is. People say, oh, I don't have a problem forgiving people. Well, yeah, but uh, you, you probably don't even realize it if you're that quick to answer it. People who um, answer stuff too fast, I, I always worry about that. Oh, I don't know. I'll never struggle with that, really. God may just put you on your back. You better be very careful about saying you never have a problem with that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've done that before. Oh, I feel like I'm pretty good at this. And then, yep, and then you fall short in that area the next day. You know, the Lord will do that to you. So be very careful to, oh, I never have problems with forgiving people. Um, you, you need to better respond that I, ju- I never want unforgiveness to come into my heart, and I pray God would keep me safe from that. Right? You on board? Okay. Stay humble, church, right? Yeah. You all be at this altar this Sunday saying, Preacher, you were right. You were right. The best way to overcome bitterness, one of the best ways to overcome bitterness is to pray for the person. Matthew 5, Jesus says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. <laughs> Does anybody ever feel like doing that? Somebody cusses you, curses you. And you're like, you know what, I just want to bless you right now. The word bless actually comes from the Greek word eulogia, where we get the word eulogy from. It means you kill them and then you give a eulogy. No, that's not what it means. That's not what it means. <laughs> well, you, a eulogy means that you... Um, um, say something well about them. You speak well of them. So um, when, they, when they curse you, you turn around and say, you know what, I know they're going through a hard time right now, but you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good guy or a good girl, and I'll be praying for them. You, you, don't, you don't put them down. And he says, do good to them that hate you, and then pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Does anybody ever feel naturally like you want to pray for somebody that is persecuting you and despitefully abusing you in some way? Like, hey, you know, I really want to pray for you right now. Can, can we pray? I know, you're, I know you're spitting on me right now with your words and your lips. You know, you're just hating me, but you don't feel like doing that. You feel like doing the same thing everybody else does. You want to smack them back, right? I mean, this, this, you feel justified in that. Lord, there's got to be a verse in the Old Testament. It's got to be back here in Judges somewhere, you know. Judges 1, you know. So um, back, you know, uh, we'll go back there somewhere. I, I think that... Um, people have come to me before and they said, preacher, I, I really need to ask you how I should respond to this. And then they'll get into the details. And sometimes after they get into the details, I'm like, what's, what's the last thing you would feel like doing? And then they tell me, I'm like, that's what you need to do. What's, what, what do you absolutely would not feel like doing in the situation? And they tell me, I'm like, yep. Because our flesh opposes the spirit. I mean, is it direct odds with it? So when somebody upsets you, flips you off at the gas station, cusses you, what's, what's the last thing you feel? I, I would not want to be nice to them. Well, be nice to them. Be gracious. Be forgiving. Be kind. Um, there, there's, there's a, usually in the Bible, if you, if, if you ever, if you don't know the biblical answer, you usually default to do the thing you don't feel like doing. Like, that's the default. Like, but I don't feel like doing that. Well, obviously. That's why love is a choice, action, and not a feeling-based thing. Uh, Let's go down to some unbiblical attitudes um, that will also cause us to be hindered. Let let me go over one more thing in this. Let me give you Matthew 5. I wasn't going to, but I think it's, it's necessary. Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Jesus said this back in Matthew. He said, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and remember there... And, and, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. This is a very, very powerful picture uh, painted by the Lord because we, didn't, we don't do this these days. They were offering animal sacrifices. We don't do that because Christ became the sacrifice to take away our sins. James Fawcett Brown commentary um, lays this out very well. 
He says the picture is drawn from life. It transports us to the moment when the Israelites, having brought the sacrifice to the court of Israelites, awaited the, the instant when the priest would approach to receive it at his hands. He waits with his gift at the rails which separates the place where he stands from the court of the priests into which the offering will presently be taken, there to be slain by the priest and by him presented upon the altar of sacrifice. It is at this solemn moment when about to cast himself on divine mercy and seek in his offering a seal of divine forgiveness that the offerer is supposed all at once to remember that some brother has just cause of complaint against him. Through breach of his commandment in one way or another, what is he to do? Is he to say, as soon as I have offered this gift, I will go straight to my brother and make it right with him? He says, no, but before any step is taken, even before the offering is presented, this reconciliation is to be sought through the gift, uh, though the gift uh, have to be left unoffered before the altar. Such a powerful thing. You're at the point of giving an animal to God as an offering that they would give. He says, before you offer that, because it's unacceptable to God. You need to go get it right with them first. That's why when Christians can be okay at being with odds with other Christians, you, you, you don't realize one day you'll stand before God and God will say, I've, you've, I've not heard anything you've said for the last 20 years. You've been out of my will for 20 years. You want to know why you weren't blessed? Because you couldn't get over yourself. You lived with, you thought they were the problem. It wasn't them. It was in your own heart. You thought it was external. The whole problem was an internal wickedness. You thought justified and you even tried to speak to me who you have offended infinitely with your sin. You've sinned more against me than they sinned against you infinitely. I'll tell you, friend, one day, some Christians are going to stand before God and hear those kind of rebukes from the God who wrote this book. What is it worth being at odds with another Christian for? I don't know any Christians at odds with other Christians, but I'm just saying you and I must guard our heart and realize it is a wicked, vile thing. What they didn't shake your hand, they took your parking spot. I remember early in the church, one of the... Somebody who... Up to that point, I had a high level of respect for. Got so upset, they left the event because somebody took his corn that he made and mixed it with the other corns. You know how we like have big days and people bring in corn and then you're pouring it in there? His special corn from the golden ear, <laughs> sanctified in his oven, with his own butter and mixture. I would have liked to have tasted it, actually. <laughs> the chance was lost when it got mixed with the other kernels. How dare the taste buds never being able to salivate over his little kernel. I mean, just so intensely upset. I remember in Chillicothe, a similar incident when, when a family got so upset they didn't want to come back because nobody ate their macaroni and cheese. So upset. So upset. And I just thought, well, maybe your macaroni and cheese wasn't good. I, who cares? I mean, you know, we don't have special events for the food. Do you know that? You know, the purpose for it is not so we can see how wonderful our food is. It's so that people will bring their friends and they can hear the gospel that they might be saved. Just so, it's like just so missing it. Isn't it just sad? So sad. There's, there's, I, I just move on because it's a waste of life to talk about silly things. But th those are the kind of things that though we can get at odds with people over silly things. And I think we look at that as silly. But you know, God looks at us and says, you think that's silly. I see it as silly for these other areas. Families being at odds, couples, children, Christians. Let me give you last uh, three. These will be pretty quick. Number eight, unbiblical attitude toward your spouse. First Peter 3, 7. Look what he says here. Ups up on the screen. He says, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife. 
as unto the weaker vessel. As, and that weaker vessel doesn't mean that she's inferior. That means that men on average are 50% stronger than women because God put in us testosterone. And uh, there is a, a, a physical, and God didn't give that to us to be superior in some way to our wife, but to protect her and to use our strength as a blessing to our wives, right? So you give honor unto her as under the weaker vessel. Go cut the firewood, go be the provider, go protect the home. If somebody tries to break in, use your strength to protect your family. And all women want that. I, I see these superheroes today, aren't, aren't like every other one's a woman. I'm like, only in Hollywood do they create this. There is not a woman that I know of. There has to be probably somebody, but I've never met them. There's not a woman who, if somebody broke in their house, they're like, stand back, husband of mine. I will guard this home. (laughs) There is not a woman that is thinking that. And no woman wants their husband to jump behind the couch and say, oh, honey, protect me. Be like that superwoman. There's not a woman that I've ever seen that wants that guy. Does any woman want that guy hiding behind the couch? Is is there any? Okay, okay, I've been yet to meet her then. No, that's that's not attractive to women. Women look at that and they're like, ugh. You would look at that and say, I don't care how good looking they are, ugh. Like that would instantly be a big turnoff. But as a man... You, you know, am I right, Doug? If you look back and your wife was hiding behind that, you'd be like, that's feminine. That's a, you know, that's, I will protect her. You know, the hair just burst out of the chest. You know, you're ready to go out there and fight and protect your wife. I mean, that's, there is something in a man that rises up to protect his wife and family. There's something in there. It's, and, and the world's trying to reverse that. It's, I, 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 I'm, there's a rabbit trail like right there. I talked to a college student the other day, and this is what he told me. He said, he said I can't even hardly, I can, I can hardly find a guy, even at Christian colleges, that is like a man. They all act so feminine now. Like, just, where's the man? Like, like a man, like just, <sighs> just keep going. I, that, that rabbit trail could run for a little ways. We'll, we'll just let her stop. So, so uh, look what he says here. He says, You husbands dwell with them according to the knowledge of giving honor unto the wife as under the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. The, the prayer here, we won't go through First Peter, but the prayer here specifically is that the wife would be saved. It's a believing husband and unbelieving wife. He says, Dwell with her according to knowledge, giving honor like, like, don't be at odds. Don't have an unbiblical attitude toward your spouse so that the prayer is not hindered. Can you be right with God and wrong with your spouse? I think this ties into the previous point. If we have unforgiveness in our hearts, bitterness, resentment, anger toward them, especially to the one that we are called to love the most, uh, it will hinder our relationship with God. Jesus said, love your enemies. How much more should we love our spouses? It is vital to pray for our spouses every day. Lift them up in prayer. Pray that you can be the husband and wife God's called you to be. See your spouse as a ministry. Once, what happens is once the spouse starts looking at them as being necessary to minister to me instead of me being to minister to them, that's when it starts going downhill. When you begin to look at your spouse and say, why aren't they doing that for me? They should be. And instead of saying, how can I help them grow to be more like Jesus Christ? I can just tell you, uh, if, if you focus on people to minister to them, it's so hard to get offended. You know, in my life, like I've dealt with a lot of things in my life. As I look at people, almost always, I almost always look at people. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not always perfect at this, but I, I, I just see people as ministry all the time. That's why I just I don't get offended with people. Rarely, it's not because of me, but when you have eyes at somebody and, and you see them as a ministry, you don't get offended with them a whole lot. I've been offended before, but the, the, when I get offended is when I begin to look at myself. I begin to think about the wounds I'm enduring. Instead of saying, you know what, maybe they are going through a hardship. Maybe, I just, maybe they just needed to vent, and maybe I just had to get hammered with that, and maybe God's going to use this to bring them to the gospel. Maybe you know. So just... When was the last time you prayed with your spouse? Those are some important things. Two last quick things. 
Number nine, praying without faith. James 1 says this, if any of you lack wisdom, James 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. It's the only time you'll see the word liberal in the Bible. All men liberally and abradeth not. It says, it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Here James is discussing the trials that we face in life. And he's saying, listen, uh, when you face trials in life, come and ask God and God will give you the answer. He'll give you wisdom and understanding how to work through that situation. In such a time, we are to ask in faith and not waver. James sees the person who wavers as somebody who's being tossed about like on the wave of the sea, like a ship, you know, and he's being tossed between faith and doubt, trust and unbelief. And it's just getting tossed around. I believe and then I don't believe. I believe and I don't believe. Have you ever been there before? You, you believe God, but then you're struggling to hold on to that. And, you know, faith allows God's shadow to be cast upon the problem. And it puts God's perspective on the situation. Doubt casts our own shadow on the problem and brings it down to a very weak level. I think it's important to set a standard in life is this. Listen very closely to what I want to say. I think it's very important to keep a standard in life that says this. Learn to talk to God about whatever trial you're going through more than you talk to anyone else about it. Did you hear that? Learn to have this standard. Say you face a situation in life that's difficult. Learn in your life to talk to God more about that first and more often than you talk to anyone else about it. You'll begin to have a God-centered focus on the trials. Could you imagine when they were out at sea? Peter, I've never seen a storm this big. Andrew, you're right, man. I mean, look at these winds. and Man, these waves are really getting high. I don't think this is going to work. I mean, look how far we have to go. We're still a couple miles. There's no way. If we, dry, if we fall out out here, we're dead for sure. We, we, I mean, th- as they begin to talk about it, but when they brought their trial to the Lord, when Jesus cast his shadow on the problem, it just calmed the whole thing down. We, I, sometimes we can, we can talk. and t- What happens when you talk about a problem? It grows, doesn't it? You ever notice that? And sometimes you have to talk things out, obviously, but make sure you pray them out first. Make sure you take them to God. Get a heavenly perspective. And then number 10, and we'll be done. You never thought we could get there. Number 10. In, <laughs> never lost faith. Number 10. Indifference to the Word of God. Proverbs 28, verse 9. Look, look what he says here. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law. Notice what he says. Very interesting. Even his prayer shall be abomination. He that turns his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. God's word is our guide in how to pray. To turn away our ear from the word of God is to come to God on our terms, on our standards, and in our way. God's Listen. God's ear is not open to us based on us in our terms. Rather, it's based on His terms. You cannot turn your ear away from God's truth and expect His ear to be turned to you. Does that make sense? Well, I'm not going to listen to preaching. I'm not going to listen to the Bible. I'm not going to obey that truth. But God, you, I need you to hear me. God's saying, if you don't listen to my word, I will not listen to your prayer. Listen to it again, Proverbs 28, verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Those who reject the truth of God's word will be rejected by God. Next week, we're going to look at 12 truths that Jesus taught about prayer. 12 different truths. We're going to continue to walk through a lot of scriptures and just giving you some principles to live through and to apply to your prayer life. And uh, so let's all stand and, and we'll bow our heads, close our eyes. And maybe tonight there's something on your heart you want to come and pray about. The altar is open. Maybe there's a burden on your heart you want to come pray for. Maybe you want to come and pray for Dwight Humbert's family. Dwight's mom passed away. That funeral was today. And I know Gene Rhodes, he's at the end of his life and just days away from passing. Uh, we have other health issues. I know Bill and Pat Benish just found out they had COVID. We want to pray for them. Maybe you want to pray for the Maple family. A lot of different prayer requests. Maybe some burdens on your heart. Maybe a family situation. Maybe a loved one that needs to be saved. Uh, want to want to give you an opportunity, whether at your seat or at an altar, to take some time to pray. Uh, if you're here tonight and you stood before God, and would you be right with Him? 
Would, would, there, would there be sin in your life that, that you know would be hindering your prayer life? Is there anything in your life that God would say, you know what, you're still at odds with that person. You've still got some sin in your life. Is there some sin that you need to confess to get clean with God so that you can be praying to God and that he would hear you? And so we are to examine ourselves and, and make sure our hearts are clean. I encourage you to come and spend some time in prayer. That act of dependence, that assault on our pride, that act of prayer. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'll be down front. People can pray with you and share with you tonight from the Word of God how you can know when your life's over you'll be in heaven. The gospel is available. You can be a child of the King tonight. You can be saved. Don't leave here tonight lost. Father, we thank you for your Word your truth. Help us to be people of prayer both early and often seeking you. May our hearts be clean that nothing is hindering our prayers. That no sin is unconfessed in our heart that we confess and forsake it. That our ear would be open to your word. That we would be humble in prayer. That we would love one another. God, I pray that you would just help us to be people faithful in prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God's spoken to your heart tonight. You can come tonight as we sing. song think about those words God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to have Brother Tom come ahead, and he's going to read our missions letter. And uh, so thank you, Brother Tom. Appreciate you. Hello, everybody. Uh, before I read the letter, um, we're going to be partnering uh, with the Senior Citizen Center across the street. More on that later. But uh, they're going to honor the veterans, and this is going to be a great event on November 12th. At 5 p.m., a uh, uh, retired general from Cedarville University is going to be the one that's going to proceeding over the ceremony. It starts at 5. All veterans on November 12th at 5 p.m. get to eat for free. Non-veterans, it's uh, $8. And they are going to serve a great meal. They're going to have a great uh, a meeting and honor of all the veterans. So the flowers will be out there. There's a phone number to call, but I'd encourage all of us uh, especially the veterans, get over there, um, uh, listen to what the general's got to say, but let's support the veterans. They, they say they have two, 300 people that attend this meeting, so that'd be great. So please get involved with that. And uh, I'm going to read a, a missionary prayer letter from um, Ali Alexander, missionary to Columbia. Uh, I'm going to read, uh, there's a sad note, and then I'll read her prayer request. Uh, Team Columbia uh, Craig and Fran Lingo were the first uh, Baptist Bible Fellowship International missionaries to Columbia. And they ser faithfully served Columbia for over 50 years. Uh, Craig's been battling with cancer for, for a few years. He came down with another illness. And on July 18th, God called him home. Craig has taught me, she says, so much over the years. And I thank the Lord for the time I got to spend with him. Please pray right now. Write her, the wife's name down if you have a pen or pencil. Ladies, just think if it was you and you've lost your dear loved one, of your husband, your love of your life over 50 years. Uh, Fran, her name is Fran, and three adult children. She wants you to pray for the wife, the three adult children. You know, in death, it's not the two, three days during the, the funeral and the few days after. It's the, when my mom passed, it was six months later that it really hit me. We, and we got to remember that when we minister to each other, it's, it's not over after three or four days. It's, I, I would find myself trying to call my mom and realizing my mom wasn't there. Then I'd just start crying. 
so even though it's been July 18th, it's been a couple months since she lost her uh, husband, I would find ways we could, you could find ways, maybe email Lisa, find ways to communicate with this lady, send her a card, do something, right? So three children, then the Colombian churches and our team. She said, we will greatly miss Craig, but there's still so much more to be done in the country of uh, Colombia. Um, and if you're young, or really any age group, the, there's dear veteran missionaries that are dying, and there's not replacements. And so the plea continually is the laborers surrender and uh, ask God if he would want you to leave the comfort of America and go to a foreign mission field. Here's her uh, two prayer requests. First, she said, um, she said uh, thank you for reaching out. And she said, uh, there's no way that they could do. She said, please let uh, Lighthouse know how important they are to the ministry in Columbia. She says, I greatly appreciate your desire to pray for us. And then she's going to put a video together, but she just didn't have time. But here's two key prayer requests. In the beginning of July, we launched a group, uh, a ministry called MANA. It's a MANA project that involves a Bible lesson, a lunch, and helping the children with their homework uh, and or tutoring. There's a time after their school is let out. They have a six- or seven-week period where the kids have nothing to do. So they use that as ministry and give the kids something to do in that gap. Uh, they said we had a great group so far, and it's our prayer that next year, next year we would even be able to receive more children. Right now, our project isn't fully funded, so we're praying that new churches would pray about supporting that project. So they need finances for the ministry of manna, ministering to these children, providing them food so they could continue to out, uh, reach out to these youngins. Then this, when I read it, I, I, I highlighted, and I'm going to give it to the pastor, we have been in our building for the last four years. It's been a tremendous blessing. We have seen how God has provided financially over the years through the faithful giving of our church members, but there's still been several months where we don't have enough to pay our rent, our bills, and the national pastor. We would love to either purchase our current church building or purchase another building and or land for the church. It would be a revolving church building fund so that the future church plants could also benefit from the funds as well. So the prayer request is the last several months they haven't had money, enough money to pay the bills. And during COVID, they, you lose support, unfortunately. And uh, so they need money to pay rent, bills, and, and the national pastor's not even being provided for. So please pray for them. Amen. That's all I've got. Flyers for the event meeting will be in the back. I'm going to be there. I hope that you come too. Appreciate that so much, and uh, we got some prayer cards. Uh, just raise those up, and we'll get those picked up. Any prayer cards? Uh, would ask you to pray for um, uh, Crystal Pereira's uh, grandparents. Uh, Crystal Pereira, she's uh, uh, her grandparents. The hospice got called in on her grandfather Floyd, and her grandmother is not doing well as as well. So I want to pray for her again. Pray for uh, Bill and Pat Benish. Um, just found out they had COVID, and then also Gene and Creta Rhodes, their health. Uh, pray for my, I have an uncle, Doug Beckett. Um, uh, it was his, uh, he found out he had um, cancer, and uh, they've given him three to six months to live. Um, and uh, if he goes through chemo, one to two years. So I want to pray for the Doug Beckett family. I'll go see them on Friday. And uh, it, was his, it was his niece that passed away just a couple, three months ago from that four-wheeler accident. And so... Uh, pretty rough on their family, and so um, uh, a couple requests that were turned in. Jennifer Dew, uh, lesions on the brain, unknown cause, only in late 30s, uh, also for salvation, and uh, for Christian influence at work, so I want to pray for Jennifer, uh, and on, also Nathan and uh, Sean for salvation, Nathan and Sean for salvation. Uh, uh, my father, Charlie Huff, had knee replacement. Uh, he's in a lot of pain, so pray for Charlie. Great guy. If you don't know Charlie, he's the he's the nice guy. Comes and uh, just shakes your hand and puts a big smile on everybody's face. Pray for Charlie. That's Kevin's dad. Pray for uh, Kelly. Is in ICU on a ventilator for COVID. Needs salvation. That's Vicky Singer's uh, nephew Kelly. So we want to lift up Kelly in ICU on a ventilator. Is on has has COVID and uh, praying for their salvation as well. Pray for Kathy Dotson. Uh, uh, urgent uh, uh, says um, uh, home 
She needs an urgent home. Okay, okay, thank you. Urgent home is for salvation for the kids. Uh, so I want to pray for Kathy Dotson. Uh, is urgent for needing need a place to stay. And um, going down, Farrell Adams in hospital in Chile. Um, uh, also has COVID, 57 years old. Paul Adams' cousin. So I want to pray for pray for uh, Farrell Adams. And then Angie Preston, liver cancer in hospice. Uh, Angie Preston, liver cancer is in hospice. So uh, that was given by Buddy Moore. So uh, I encourage you every week as we go through those to write uh, one or two of those or all of them down if you can and just really commit to praying for, for that person. Uh, that's um, let's, uh, let's all stand together and uh, if you look around, find somebody that maybe even by themselves and just invite them into your prayer group. Pray with anywhere from two to four people is always suggested group size would be great. So uh, take a moment, share prayer requests and uh, look around, find that person and uh, jump into a group with them and uh, share prayer requests and, and uh, just go around the circle and pray for the person to your right. So God bless you. Thank you for being here. We'll see you all Sunday.